Uh, moving on, the next presentation you guys are going to do about traffic signals. So, uh, and if anyone wants to leave between now and then, that's fine. But uh, let's go on to traffic signals. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Council President, Mayor, and Common Council. Um, for those who don't know, I'm Aaron Schrager, the City Engineer, Deputy DCS Director, which means I get to do the more fun presentations for the evening. So, um, Rick did a great job on his. I want to go through this very quickly, one, because We've been here before for sanitary sewer, we've been here for storm sewer, that there's a lot of the infrastructure that uh, DCS maintains that we almost don't highlight, and it's, uh, I don't want to say taken for granted, but it's just not talked about or brought to the forefront as much. So we're going to try to go over that a little bit tonight. Um, real quick on, on, sig on signals, so they've been in use for about over 100 years. There's like a legend that they tried in 1860 in London with one that had kerosene oil and it caught fire and ended very badly. So the electronic ones were um, started about 100 years ago. So uh, we can't just throw them up anywhere. You complete a warrant analysis to uh, justify it as prepared by an engineer. Um, some of ours that have been up forever, I can't say how they went up, but we could assume they follow pretty good practice. Um, design is governed by what we call the MUTCD, which is a very thick book that engineers use for uh, it's called the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Um, I don't think it's the same, but I'll make it up, but it's, it's, not, it's not your mother's traffic signal anymore. I mean, they're very complex electronic systems. They used to have hard wire, and um, a lot of public works would, would fix most of it um, you know, in-house, but you'll see later on that uh, it's not um, the case anymore. Um, and they're not free. So each signal can run about $150,000 to $200,000. Um, you can go higher depending on the level of bells and whistles, but that's kind of a standard price for a simple installation. Obviously, you could save some money when you do them as part of a project, which is a, what we try to do, but more on that later. Um, so what we have here, and this is one of our more advanced, newer signals. So this is over on the forest. Um, probably just looks like a mundane green box, but when you open the control box up, this is what you have inside. So you can kind of see the complexity there. Um, you're no longer talking traffic loops, you talk cameras, the timing. Um, there's a lot going on there. Um, and by no means am I an expert in the, the inners of them. Um, to the left side there, that's just your standard meter panel. because They are electric, so um, standard right off the pole electricity. Um, good thing is with you know modern day LED technology, you know the cost to operate these is reduced. Uh, front panel right here, which is here, that opens up with a uh, special um, funky looking key here. This looks like a fake key. Um, that's the police access panel. So when you open just that, you can either throw it to flash mode, you could switch it to generator, or you could switch it to manual operation. This wire here is just a push button, so an, an officer. Um, or engineer could um, keep changing the cycle manually. You would do that if you have a you know significant event or just need to move traffic along. Uh, on the side, you'll see this. That's, uh, that's my reflection. Um, this is the generator <laughs> generator hookup right there. So you'll see that in the side of, of them. Um, little top hat right here, Garmin. It's just the GPS sync timing. So. We don't have these on very many, but um, these are the DeForest signals, the newer ones, so they, they do talk to each other. So um, even when we've tested it for generator, when you actually knock the power out, a couple cycles later, they are back together. So um, if you're ever bored of the light, just look right or left, and you'll see that they are working in sync. Uh, some of your more standard hardware is uh, you know the mast arm, the, uh, the post over here. This is just the head itself. And then up here, what you see a lot, that's the camera detection. That's, you know, in the effort to increase the efficiency of um, intersections. That is actually set to certain cycles that that will detect the vehicle and will move the cycle along. So um, depending where it is, like so on the forest, the forest always has green until the approaches come, and that will start the cycle. Uh, back in the day, which they still exist, not very many, used to be a traffic loop in the ground. Almost looked like gum in a perfect square. That was the older technology. This is the new technology right here. Uh, people have thought it's actually filming them, that it's a red light camera, none of which is true. That is just detecting vehicles to start the cycle. Um, the head itself, most people kind of when they see this are kind of shocked at the actual size of it. So um, this is the size of it. This is um, 
um, hanging 15 feet in the air, and then you suddenly realize why you could see it from a half mile away. They're large, so um, it's a little difficult to see because I forgot that the visors are pointed down for obvious reasons, but uh, when you scroll through here, what you have um, for the red light, this is your older technology here. That's what I did back there. Uh, all right, sorry about that. This is what we do to our legal counsel. <laughs> so that is your... Uh, that's your older Can't see. technology, it's an incandescent bulb. It uses more electricity, doesn't last as long. Uh, we have very few of them left, we've been swapping out. Um, as you kind of scroll down through here, all the way, yellow. This would be your modern day LED. And again, so now it's a lot different. This is actually like one individual unit attached, there's nothing to change. So, mm. um, far more efficient. And uh, we have swapped most of ours out to that currently. So, and now this is the standard turn hour there. So. But that is, um, that is your standard signal right there. So, um, Another reason we're here, we just completed an inventory and what we call an efficiency project. So uh, the, the reason the project came to be it was identified by an emergency dispatch in 2016. So what happened at that time, uh, the dispatch center actually called um, Union County to come to a signal. Why they came out, I don't know, because they don't maintain any of the signals in the city. Uh, they came out, said it wasn't theirs, then they called me, and then they called um, uh, city DPW staff to come out. And it just raised the question of, what do we have out there? How do we know who has what to just speed things along and be more efficient? So that began in 2016. It wrapped up this summer, and it had three primary goals. So. First one was to obtain a comprehensive inventory of our signal network. Second was to prepare for emergency situations. Knock on wood, hope we don't have any, but um, unfortunately we do and we're pretty well prepared for it. Uh, to establish a procedure for the maintenance and the response for call-outs. And we have to point out, it's a group effort. Signals don't really fall under anyone. It's engineering, it's public works, and it's police. So we also had to kind of pool everyone together to uh, get all the information we had um, in one place. Comprehensive inventory, I will email this around, but this basically summarizes the 30 signals we have um, along, it's a cheat sheet really. Uh, the mission of the cheat sheet is to get this laminated and installed, in, not installed, just given to all the uh, police vehicles, DPW vehicles and engineering vehicles because it's a lot of information that you should have just readily available. Um, inventory revealed, we have 30 city-owned traffic signals. So that's 30 we physically maintain. Six additional, which would be 36 then, um, are in the city, but they're DOT owned and operated. Um, example would be like off the ramps from 78. Uh, four are the city's sole responsibility. So what that means is we bear the cost for replacing them and the maintenance of them. Most signals are on a county road, so the county will replace them and install them, but then it's ours to maintain. Um, those, and those are DeForest and downtown in Springfield, because those are city roads, they're our signals. Um, uh, four, we just have four flashing traffic signals, there's one over by Brayton School. Um, there's three of those RRFBs, they're rapid rectangular flashing beacons. Six of the school flashing beacons that are you know, programmed just to come on um, morning and afternoon drop off, or pick up rather. Uh, and there's a whole, we have a whole slew of them. Oldest is 1992, that's at Broad and Walnut. It's still working. We'll probably ask the county to replace that soon, but it's operating fine. And the newest is the forest that came on 2017. Goal two, emergency preparedness. So primary power, they all operate in standard, run on the mill electricity. Um, alternate power is battery. So now all 30 have a battery backup. Um, what you have for runtime is, it's anyone's guess, these batteries are sitting in a non-climate controlled um, environment for years on end. Um, you could get one, you could get 12 hours, but you'll get some amount of time to permit first responders to uh, make adjustments. Uh, after that you go to a portable generator. So all 30 are now generator ready. All 30 have a cable in the box just to make it more efficient. So anyone with a, well not anyone, um, <laughs> DCS or police showing up with the keys can install a generator almost uh, um, instantly. Um, and additional cables are in the, you know, with police, public works, and engineering vehicles. 
we installed uh, telltale lights, as they call them. So if you've driven around and seen these signals, right here, green light means everything is okay. Um, if the red light's on, it doesn't mean everything's bad. It might be on battery, it might be in the generator, or it might have had a previous failure. So it's just good to know. For a while, they were reversed a little bit, but now everyone has red and green, so it's easy for police, engineering, public works driving around to know something's up with that signal. Goal three, maintenance and response. So you know, going back to the first problem we identified, everyone now has a sticker on it identifying whose jurisdiction it is. S1 means it's a summit signal. S2, it's a summit flasher. NJ1, um, it's DOT. So at least whoever's on the scene first knows exactly who to call to get response to the signal. So summarize what we've done over the last two summers in addition to the inventory. We installed the 30 telltale lights. We added camera detection at four intersections. Um, had to get additional cables for 18 signals. Generator hookups at nine, so that completes the whole program. We started um, by the police just after Sandy or Irene, I, I missed them up. Um, battery backup was missing at four signals, and then we've made the inventory cheat sheet for ECS and police. So the next steps, we still need to schedule a coordination meeting with police just to go over and make sure they get the laminated forms and just go over some processes and how we're going to operate moving forward. Uh, the generators shown they are currently down in the basement here. They're going to get moved to nice storage at Public Works. Um, and we're going to actually initiate an, an, an annual maintenance of the signals, not just be proactive. We're going to go once a year because they even have some things like light bulbs in them, filters that just should be replaced. Um, not shown here, but now that this is complete and the Morris Avenue Bridge is open, we will move on to timing changes. Um, people have asked about that. We've played with some over the years. We have not had normal traffic for three years. Um, now school is back, so now's the time we'll start identifying areas. Um, Morris Avenue is one that comes up pretty frequently. That was done by the county in like 06, but timing might have slipped. Traffic patterns have changed, so. Now we're able to move on to that. We have an inventory of what we have, because the inventory also has the detail for what the controllers are and items and the timing itself. So now we actually can, can proceed with that. Just for the listening audience, um, always operate the pedestrian push buttons, the ones that have them. Um, they're taken for granted sometimes. And first, if they don't work, let us know. But uh, not every intersection is in a recall mode, which means it automatically pops up. So you do see it by some of our garages that if you don't hit it, you won't get the walk. So this is just a safety thing. So just always hit the button. It takes a second. Um, if you see red tail lights on, call police. I'd say you can call DCS too, but if it's after hours, just it can get the word out and they can move the process to dispatch. Um, same thing with signal malfunctions. You know, especially at nighttime, it's six square miles. They have you know, a few officers on the road. They might not pass all 30 signals within a reasonable amount of time. Worst thing dispatch could say is, we know about it. So. But generally, if we know about it, we'd have something there or, or you know, set up something. Um, and then just seven of our signals go to flashers overnight, people out that late. Just be aware if it's red and it's yellow, just to you know, operate accordingly. Um, that's it. That's old school and Schenectady, New York, right there. Um, I don't have anything more, so I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks for a Thank very interesting presentation. Uh, Marjorie. Thank you for the presentation, Aaron. Um, I was just wondering, for county roads, who sets the timing? Is it us or the county? Uh, it's the county initially, but then we can alter it moving forward. So, so, so when we request one, one, we can bring up River Road and Chatham Road is getting a signal. We completed a warrant analysis. The county agreed. They're going to fund the signal. So they would present the study. Well, they would present the signal based on the data they obtained. Um, I believe it'll be this winter that they'll get this traffic data. So as that moves over time, as, as timing changes, or the need for timing changes, it would fall on us. So. And we don't have to go back to the county to do it. We can just go ahead and do that. We always run it by them, but the last uh -huh. few times they just let us do what we needed to do. OK, thank you. No, I was just going to comment on the same issue of timing, is that most of the complaints I get are Morris Avenue. Right. And I'm really glad to hear that's on the to-do list. Yeah. yeah. I have one question. Uh, going from DeForest, uh, which turns then into Kent Place Boulevard, where the Morris Avenue, where the bridge is now completed, right. there are people who t end up turning left onto the bridge when you're not supposed to. Is there any way we could put some, because there's a signal that's there at the coming from onto the, from 
up the bridge on Mars coming towards making the left onto Springfield Avenue, there's a little box kind of signal that says no left turn from certain hours. Is there a way of putting something on that pole, signal pole to show you can't make a left? Because people do it all the time and it's really dangerous. Where's my from Camp Place? Up when you're when you're going from yeah. when you're going so up to far going to force towards Kent Place, the JCC is on the right. on the left side, right? The bridge is on your right. uh, on your on your left side. Sorry, the JCC is on your right. right. So J, the bridge is on your left. You're not supposed to make a left, and there's a like a little sign that says "Do not make a left." But people, there's plenty of people who ignore it. It seems. So is there a way of, and I think it may be a visual thing that people are looking at the light in front of them, they're not looking at the sign to the side of them? Well, we'll look at it. I mean, we did check that the sign was still there, but if, if I had to imagine that probably something of the geometrics have changed just slightly enough that makes it more enticing despite, you know, years of not being able to do it, it's just mm -hmm. probably something to the eye where they're like, oh, this looks safer now, um, despite the sign being there. Yeah, I, I don't um, know what it is, but, but I've we'll seen people do it. Way. All the time. <laughs> no, we had coming down the hill taking right, we had a, a fair amount of people lately, mm -hmm. but we just put new signs up for that too. So um, so definitely some geometrics have changed or that people are, um, you know, pushing the envelope a little bit and um, we got to keep it safe. So. Okay. Um, uh, Matt? Uh, in the green boxes, do the generator hookups, they can send power out as well or only in? In terms of... Um, well, which which box? So the, the generator gets hooked up next to it, and then it puts directly into the signal box itself, so it's operating right. it. If the generator has just an extra plug on it, yes, you could plug something in on it. I'm not sure if it does. It, it might, actually, so. Um, just wondering, if you needed yeah. power, could you go out from the traffic signal or not? Yeah, well, if you actually look in the actual um, electric meter box, so in here, you do have but that's like little, little power if you need a big hookup. No, because they, they operate on such little power at this point. I mean, you, you would just get your standard, you know, 120 oh. volt. Um, okay. Thank you. Mike? Yeah, thanks, Aaron, for the presentation. Um, just quickly, you mentioned a, a light going in at Chatham and River. Just um, for people at home, I know we've got another uh, installation eventually that's going to be on River and uh, Passaic, right? Yes, so right. River and Passaic is being uh, funded by the developer. Right. Um, should get underway probably about the same time. Then you also have Sunrise, which is right at Morris and um, River. They'll be adding a phase to that signal, so I'll hold another setup to let them leave their site. Where is that going to be? That's, right, that's at, right at where the... That's um, right where Morris hits River. So. so those are actually two competing construction sites right now. So as part of it, there will be some interconnectivity between the three of them because now you're going from one signal without a phase facing north and now three. That could create chaos. So that's part of the requirement for Sunrise will be installing the, um, I guess, probability, but the connectivity. So. Right. So um, just to follow on on that, are there any other um, intersections that you guys with the police are looking at that uh, might warrant a, a traffic signal? Or, and, and what is the process uh, for that to happen? Um, would really be, there would have to be some request either from you know, the safety committee or works committee or something that we know has accident history or it's just not flowing uh, properly or as efficiently as it could and then it would be just having a warrant uh, analysis completed so um, we've looked at none really recently the last warrant analysis we did was actually um, was Chatham and, and River we did one for Hobart and, and Springfield a while back which actually didn't meet it but then again we were on a three-year kind of hiatus with the, with the traffic pattern because you don't want to install one or do a warrant analysis when you have a detour in place because then you're on the hook for having installed that signal, possibly with you know, improper traffic volumes. So, but, but now is, is, the, is the time if there's anywhere out there that people think. So. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone from the public that has any questions, comments, suggestions, ideas? Great. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Thank you Rick. Thank you. Excellent presentation, guys, both of you. Thank you.